Good morning, Gateway Church. How's everyone doing today? Why don't you stand your feet, put your hands together, and let's have some fun this morning, sing them some songs. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of waste? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. When you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day And the freedom is all that I know glad that we can live a life of freedom in Christ. Amen? Let's sing this. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the end. Future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name And welcome to Gateway. My name is Gabby, and it is so good to have you here with us this morning. If you are new here, maybe this is your first time, we want to just say welcome. We are so glad that you're with us this morning, and we would love the opportunity just to get to know you a little bit better and to give you a gift. So after service, we invite you to go out into the atrium there, and we will give that to you. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we want to say welcome to you too this morning. We would love if you could do us a huge favor click the share button just so people know what's going on here at Gateway. So our theme for 2019 is Rest Assured, and we are continuing our series here today called Are We Good? And I hope that you enjoy everything that we have in store for you this morning. 
We also have an excellent children's program. If you have young ones, kids, please feel free to take them out into the atrium there and someone will be glad to show you where they can go. As well, students, uh, to six to grade eight, we have something for you this morning as well during the talk portion. So you can just wait for a slide to pop up and they will dismiss you when to go. Now we're gonna meet a few people, um, mingle around, but I do have a, a little would you rather for you. This Thursday is Valentine's Day. Men, don't forget Valentine's Day. So I have a question for you. You can ask the people around you. Would you rather cook a yummy meal at home or would you rather go out for dinner? So mingle around, ask people those questions, and we'll be back shortly. Precisely what we're gonna do In your presence is where I am free I could never fathom your love for me Let your spirit be the strength within The power that conquered great and sin All right, trust you guys had a great time meeting with friends, and we're going to sing another song here called Nothing Is Impossible. It goes like this. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all 
things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible through you Blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I'm living by faith Nothing is impossible You're here with me And I know that You can do anything Through you I can do anything I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you Blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I'm living by faith Nothing is impossible I'm not gonna live by what I see I'm not gonna live by what I feel down. I know that you're here with me. I know that you can do anything. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. You know, we serve an incredible God through whom nothing is impossible, amen? And because we serve a God who loves us so much, whenever we face the storms of life, we can rest assured and not be shaken in who he is and in his consistency. I want you to sing this. Cause we trust in our God And through his unfailing love 
We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. For we trust in our God and through His unfailing love we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken
Thank you, Father, that we can trust in you in your unfailing love, even though we fail. Even though we look into our lives, and sometimes we're shaken to the core. And we're learning what it means to stand by faith and to trust in you. And for some of us, it's not been a good week. And we're trying to figure it all out. And we gather today to remind one another and to remind ourselves that though our world be shaken, you're unshaken. It's our faith and our trust in you that though everything else fall apart, you won't because you are. So today we trust you. Today we remind ourselves that regardless of what is happening, Regardless of what that phone call was or that letter, that conversation, some of the things that didn't go right this week and we're just kind of wondering now, what am I going to do? The hurt, the pain, the question, the wonder. You're unshaken. You're unshaken. We draw comfort in that today. Nothing happened that surprised you. Nothing caught you off guard. Thank you that your love continues to be unfailing in our lives. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you today. You may have a seat. It doesn't take much to share the warmth. Sometimes it's just a cup of coffee, a few kind words, stepping outside your comfort zone. The coldest night of the year is here. Together, we're walking to help hungry, homeless, and hurting people and families in our community. So join us this February. Start a team, register to walk, and fundraise. Let's share the warmth, because it's cold out there. We need to share the warmth because it's still cold out there. My goodness, spring's got to be all around the corner somewhere. How many are waiting for spring? My goodness, I am ready for it. Bring it on. But in the meantime, we have people in our communities that are still living out in the streets. They are homeless and they need shelter. And this gives us an opportunity to raise some funds. And we'd love for you to be a part of our team. Coldest night of the year. It's coming up. Out in the atrium, there's a table that you can sign up. And we'd love to be a part of that. Ushers will receive your giving today. We love to practice generosity. Generosity allows us to do some of these things that we're involved in that allow us to bless the people in London and around the world. And we're just so grateful to take the resources that uh, God has blessed us with and to use that generosity to bless so many. There are a variety of ways in which you can give on person, online, text, debit. There's all kinds of ways you can give. I trust that you find the best one for you and that you were able to do just that practice generosity. And we're just so grateful. One of the things we've got coming up, it's really, really down into the spring on May the 4th. We're having a spring market coming up on May the 4th on a Saturday. And the reason why we're letting you know now is because there's lots of vendors vendors that are here in our uh, community and perhaps you would want to be one of the vendors that's going to be in the spring market. We are going to be raising the funds for the London Crisis Pregnancy Center and uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, help us to be a part of that. If you're a vendor, you want to be a part of this. This is going to be open to the entire public, open here in London. It'll just be a big, big event and uh, if you are a vendor, you want to be a part of this, there's information out in the foyer and we'll be able to help you uh, with that today. Those are just a couple of things that got, we have coming up amongst others, and I trust that you'll take advantage of all the great things that are happening in our Connect table out in the back. God bless you as we continue to worship him now.
Won't you stand with us? Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are Yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this time free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Let's sing it. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. Your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness? I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Yeah. 
is a yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to your people. God, we thank you, Lord, that we can stand here today being confident of who you are. God, that we can declare the truth of your promises. God, we can rest assured, Lord, that you are consistent when we are not. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You guys can have a seat. I know your story. I've read it cover to cover. And I know the storms that will come. The waves will swell and the sky will darken. Though you'll fight against the current, you'll be swept away. You'll feel helpless and abandoned. And you'll wonder where I am in the midst of it all. I know this isn't the way you thought our relationship would work, but my plans are not for my comfort or yours. My purposes are always and only an expression of love. The scars in my hands are proof that love will sometimes lead you directly into the storm. Though you can't understand my plans, you can trust in one thing, that I am entirely good you can't even imagine how good I am, and my plan for you is no different. When you shout asking where I am, know that I am right behind you, with my arms wrapped tightly around you, whispering, I will never let go. For you are the pinnacle of my creation and the center of my affection. There will come a day when I will quiet every storm, and wipe away every tear. In that day, there will be no more pain or death. But until that day comes, I will be your anchor in this storm. good? It's the question we ask one another after a conflict or a disagreement. It's also one of the questions we ask ourselves when we're in the mirror, looking in the mirror, am I good? I mean, we may not word it that way, but the question is still a good one to consider. It's good to talk to yourself in the mirror once in a while and just say, hey, am I good? Are we good? I suppose it's not a bad question to ask of God once in a while. I mean, when was the last time you said, hey, God, are we good? Am I good? As we continue on in this spiritual journey, as we continue to take our best steps in the direction that we believe that he's called us to, or at least strive to in our endeavors to cultivate and develop a personal relationship with him deep down in our lives, there's always this nagging question, am I good? Are we good? So thank you for joining with us today. That's the name of our series and part of our theme for 2019, Rest Assured. And we're so glad to have you with us online or joining at one of our campus locations, or perhaps you're listening a little bit later on. Thank you for giving us some of your time in the next 25 or 30 minutes. Hopefully we will have some value for your life and that God will actually speak to you because we believe that he still does. Last week, we began this series and we talked about margin and the need for margin in our lives. The, the idea that being that without margin, we won't be good anywhere in our lives. 
And margin is the space between our load and our limits. Margin is the space between our load and our limits. It's the gap between rest and exhaustion. It's that space between breathing freely and feeling like you're suffocating. Margin is the opposite of overload. That if we are overloaded in life, we will have no margin. And we are be, we're talking about this in every aspect of our lives. Today I want to talk about emotional health. Next week, uh, uh, Pastor Cheryl's going to be speaking about relational health. And then we're going to end on mental health. And it's an important topic today as we talk about emotional health because we don't talk about emotional health very often in the church. We don't talk about our emotions, I think, enough. Margin, if margin is the amount of available beyond what is necessary, that distance between what you have and what you need, when the supply is exceeded by demand, emotions get frazzled, they get strained. And never more is it more obvious to us when we talk about emotional health between what you have and what you need, does it show up in our emotional health? So when we talk about emotional health and the boundaries and margins, the discussion is often about a diminishing resource. Meaning that we have emotions, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to capitalize on emotions that are dwindling. It's like we give out emotionally and we're burning the gas tank of emotions over and over and over daily, daily, daily. But what happens is, is our emotions get frazzled and worn out and we find ourselves running on empty because we're over margined in our lives. And when we're emotionally overtaxed, we often say things that we don't normally, uh, would normally say. We do things we would not normally do. And, it, and, and it, it solicits a response in our relationships from people and they'll go, wow, that's not like them. Why, why would they do that? Boy, that's so out of character. That's, that's not their pattern. I, I can't believe they did that. Are they good? Are they Okay. Now, this is a huge discussion, isn't it, when it comes to emotions? And we're really talking about how to deal with how you feel. How to deal with how you feel. And some of the big questions that comes with the emotional discussion is that why are sometimes my emotions so hard to control? I mean, it's just emotions. I should be able to control them. I shouldn't have outbursts of anger. I shouldn't be crying all the time. I, I shouldn't find myself in depression. I shouldn't find myself numb to some of the experiences that happen. Why can't I control it? Why can't I turn the volume up on the good feelings and down on the bad ones? Why are the good feelings seeming to be so quiet in my life? And why are the negative emotions just so out of control and they just seem to roar at me all the time and I can't bring the volume down? Why is it that I can't stop the stories that are swirling in my head, those narratives? You all know what I'm talking about when something happens and, and there's a situation in my life and, and, and I don't get a chance to respond to something and I begin to tell myself the story and, and the narrative starts to play off in my head and, and the most dangerous thing is to have my phone or my laptop near me when those emotions start and when that, those narratives, because I'm... I'm Oh, you can't wait to get on them. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And we start telling these stories, and it doesn't have to be based on truth. It's just the story that we tell ourselves. And the more we tell ourselves the stories, the more the narratives roll in our head. They begin to escalate, don't they? The emotions get that much more stronger and that much more determined. And that person gets me so mad, and they just get me so angry when I think about this. I just, got, I just, if I could just, or fear, and I just get overwhelmed. And it's like those big waves, and it just keeps rolling over me. And I keep telling the story, and I don't see how it's going to turn around. I don't necessarily see how it's going to get better, and it is, it, it's going to drown me. I'm not going to be able to make it, and I can't, I can't breathe. And it's just, it's like a panic attack, and it just keeps coming at me, and I don't know what to do. And then we look around at those people. You know those people. They just seem to have it all together. They just seem to always be on that even keel. I married one of those. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what. They just seem to always kind of have it together. And when we look at certain people, with e, we would describe as having a, a, an emotional health. We would often use the word, I looked it up, we would often have uh, the word associated with well-being, a, 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 a good sense of well-being or as having a sense of contentment, 
or a person that has emotionally healthy has a good zest for life and they're, they're kind of always up. Or we might say it's the ability to deal with stress and obstacles or, or having more sense of meaning or purpose. Or we could go on and on and on and talk about the ability to be flexible and the ability to adapt or being good at balancing life and work. And, and we would have all these definitions of what emotionally healthy looks like. But at the at the underlying issue, it's keeping my joy high, my anger low, and my fear under control. It's about keeping my joy high, my anger low, and my fear under control. And it's probably, not always, but it's probably one of the things that led you to consider becoming a Christ follower. For those of you who came to Christ at, at later ages in your life, something was going on in your life and it wasn't making sense. Something in your life was not in control. Something in your life was falling apart and deep in your heart, deep in your emotions, you couldn't get a handle on it. And, and you couldn't get right without making things right between you and God. And you didn't quite word it that way. and You didn't quite understand it that way. But somewhere along the line, you began to identify that I need to get right with God. And if I can get right with God, maybe I can get a handle on those things that are not right in my heart. Now, I think it's good to mention as we talk about uh, emotional health that we're not talking here about not having negative emotions. Because sometimes we make the mistake of saying that if I'm going to be emotionally healthy, I just have to be happy, happy, happy all the time. That I'm not allowed to have negative feelings. But rather, it's about giving yourself the freedom to experience the negative emotions in life, knowing that when you have those moments, when you have down days, sad days, angering days, fearful days, anxious days, that it is not going to affect your overall emotional health or happiness. Or not having to hide the negative emotions for feel that it will ruin you emotionally deep down inside. So having emotional health does not imply the absence of negative emotions or faking them. And when we consistently find ourselves blaming other people or other situations for the emotions that we are experiencing, we need to realize that we can be emotion we can't be emotionally healthy without being emotionally aware. And that's a good beginning point for us. We can't be emotionally healthy without being emotionally aware. And we will never grow in our spiritual journey without emotional health. And this is why for some of you, you're a Christ follower, but you find yourself always stumbling. You find yourself always struggling. You know you're saved. You're going to the Bible studies. You're reading your Bible. You're praying to God. You're coming on Sunday. But you find yourself going, why am I not further along in this journey? Because emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. Pilo Cesaro wrote a book. It's very famous right now, and everybody's kind of doing it. He wrote a book on emotional health and emotional spiritual health. And our ladies' Bible study on Thursdays are going through it. <clears throat> and he says this, emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Now, some of you, you just leave that on the screen. Some of you need to sit on that statement for just a few minutes here. You need to consider that emotional health and spiritual maturity, that is progressing in your walk with God, they're inseparable. In other words, you can't have one without the other. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Because we can go our entire lives never truly under, understanding our emotions and never being able to get a handle on them. Now, I know this is a really, really heavy topic today. It's tough stuff. So turn to someone and say, boy, you really need help with this, but I'm here for you. And you know what? I got your back. Because I know it's not you, but the person you're with, boy, do they have some baggage. Wow. At the end of the day, I think a big part of emotional health comes when you're comfortable in your own skin. It's not about trying to get yourself um, to an emotional place where, like, you're here and you really want to be here, and so you're constantly fighting to get to there, wherever there is. I think the beginning of emotional health comes with being comfortable in your own skin, knowing who you are and knowing where you're at. Now, there's a lot of talk right now. It's very, very popular on Instagram and very popular amongst especially young adults on Enneagrams or Enneagrams. How many know what I'm talking about here? If you, how many know what your number is? One, two, three, tell me your number. I'm a what? Two. Oh, twos and tens. Can you guess what I am? Eight. All the way eight, baby. There's nothing else but eight in me. So if you don't know what Enneagrams are, you really want to look it up. It's a very simple test. But it's really, it's actually, it's so good, it's scary. 
It's scary in helping you to identify. You'll do the, the Enneagram, and when you're done with it, you'll go, <gasps> it's been living with me all this time because they'll, it will peg you in an incredible way. But it's actually really good because it's an eye-opening to understanding some of the whys in your life. The whys in your life. Why do I do this all the time? Why do I always react this way? Why does this always push my buttons and set me off? Why does this have me pull back and recluse? Why do I care so much about this? And why do I not care at all about this? You can Google it up. There's all kinds. It's free. It's easy. It takes you about 10 minutes. But you can have lots of fun with it, especially with your friends, your family, your spouses, significant other. So some basic thoughts to get us started today about emotional health. First of all, many of us don't realize that God's emotional. That God has feelings. And it's a great place to begin today when we talk about understanding our spiritual and emotional health. That God feels joy. God feels grief. God gets sad. God feels pain. God feels anger and hatred towards sin. God gets frustrated with the people in his life like you get frustrated with the people in your life. In fact, God gets probably a little frustrated with you sometimes. You always say, well, God, I'm really frustrated with God right now. Hey, right back at you. <laughs> so God has emotions. And I would suggest to you that the reason why you have emotions is because God has emotions because we're made in the image of God. If God had no emotions, neither would you. Now, Cesaro later on in his book on emotional spirituality said this. He said, ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality. And reality is where we meet God. I love that. So when you deny your emotions, if you ignore your emotions, you're ignoring reality. And reality is where you meet God. Emotions are the language of the soul. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. So our emotions are a gift from God. And it might not seem that way sometimes, especially when we talk about the role of negative emotions in our lives. But I would suggest to you today that all emotions are part of God's gifting to us because God is emotional. He has made us emotional. Emotions motivate us. Emotions move us. Emotions protect us. Can you imagine living your life without any emotions? Missing out on the power of happiness, the power of passion, of courageous resolve, the depth of feeling, even the loss of a loved one. When I do a funeral, I'll talk to certain people and they'll, they're so grief stricken and they're at this place and they'll, their heart is aching. They've lost a loved one, especially if they've had that loved one in their life for many, many years. And while their heart is breaking and they'll come to me and they'll say, oh, pastor, it hurts so much. I wish I didn't hurt. And I don't say this to them, but, but I understand what they're saying because for them, the depth of their pain hurts too much, but you would not wish that hurt to go away because if there was no depth of hurt, if there was no depth of pain, there would be no depth of love. The reason why you grieve and the reason why grief is so hard is because it measures the depth of our love. If I were to remove the grief and remove the pain, you'd remove the love. There's a place for fear. There's a place for danger, for, ang for, uh, for anger. Healthy fear keeps us safe and it gives us guardrails. When, when, when we have a healthy fear in our lives and go, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't go there. I shouldn't be with this person. Guardrails are very important in our life. And without a measure of anger, you'd never stand up against evil or wrong. If you didn't have a healthy measure of anger, you would never defend others in your lives. You would never find the courage to step up and to stop the, the motives, uh, the hurtful motives of others. Without emotions, life would look like a black and white movie. Emotions bring the color. And it's your emotional ability that allows you to love. It allows you to create and to be faithful and loyal and kind and passionate and generous and creations, courageous. Now, there are two extremes to avoid when we talk about emotions. One is emotionalism. The other one is stoicism. Emotionalism says that only emotions count. That all that matters is how I feel. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter whether something's right or wrong. It's if it feels so right... How can it be wrong? 
And then there's stoicism where feelings aren't important at all. It's kind of the exact opposite. That all that matters is your thought life, your intellect, your will, your volition, your, your intelligence. A stoic says emotions are not part of it. Feelings don't matter. St- get rid of the feelings because all we need to do is to learn more and we'd be okay. Now, it's really, really funny because often what happens is, is stoics marry emotional people. I like to call them stuffers and gushers. And the reason why you're laughing is because one of you is married to a stuffer or a gusher. You know what I'm talking about. And and if you're trying to figure out who the stuffer is and who the gusher is, one of the persons stuffs the feelings down in and denies them and doesn't want to talk them out and doesn't want to want to do anything. And the emotional person one, you know what, the, 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 the gusher is the one that just wants everybody to feel. And so if you're the stuffer today and there's a fight between you and your spouse, they're the one that kind of shut up. They don't say anything. They go quiet and they just kind of walk off. They walk out of the room because they just don't want it. They don't want to deal with anything. And the emotional person is the one who's chasing right after them. <laughs> Get back here and fight like a man. Get out from underneath that bed. Stand up and let's get at this. Stuffers and gushers. And it's not a bad thing. Because, I mean, think about it. If you had two stuffers that were married together, that'd be a pretty cold marriage. And if you had two gushers, that'd be pretty volatile. So, what are the games that we play? What are the things that... What are the things that play with my emotions? What is it that I need to watch out for? What are, the, what are the signs that they go, you know what, when I get into this, this is what causes problems with my emotions. The first one is the, to me was the most obvious and that's sin. Sin is one of the areas where emotions get played with the most. The wrong things we do, the little ones at first, if there's such a thing as a little thing, but those things that give way to larger and more consequential actions. Now, sin is a church word. If you're new to the church, uh, I understand that you may not, you may not understand uh, sin, but I'm simply talking about those things that we know and believe to be wrong, but do them anyways. Sin is simply the things that we know to be wrong and we do them anyways. They're, they're falling short of what God's best is for a life. And anything you know to be contrary to what God wants for your life, whether you agree or not, you keep doing those things even though you know that they are wrong. There is a price for that. Rebelling against your conscience will suck the emotional energy out of your life. Nothing will rob you of joy and peace and happiness by doing something that you know to be wrong and you're doing it anyways. And without it, you will experience a fear that just doesn't make sense and an anger that has no scale. You cannot continually to believe one thing and to behave in another way. And you can get away with it for a long, long time, but I can tell you that emotionally it catches up with you even though you can't put your finger on it. Some of you today are struggling emotionally and you think, I just need to pray more. And the issue is not praying. I, some of you think I just need to read the Bible more and the issue is you don't need to read the Bible anymore. You need to do what the Bible says. You need to stop talking to God about it and just stop beha- start behaving and doing the things that you know are wrong in your life and quit arguing with God. And, and I know that I'm right with some of you right now because as I've been having this conversation, something popped up in your head. That's the thing. Whatever that is, Not everybody, but for many of you, something came into your head while I was having that conversation. I can tell you this, for some of you, emotional health won't come until you deal with whatever that is, that thing that you're fighting with right now. Another thing that plays with our mind is shame. I think shame plays with our emotions. When we feel the sin becomes more than we can bear, guilt is what we are, but shame is what we feel. Guilt is what we are. We're guilty, but shame is what we feel. When you look at things that happen in your life and you think the whole world is looking down on you, when you look in the mirror and you're looking down on yourself, that is shame. And shame will ruin you emotionally. I think stress. I think stress is another thing. Wrong priority in your lives. And we talked about this a lot last week, but we get ourselves emotionally worn out when we find ourselves dancing to the beat of somebody else's drum with no margin in our life. And when you are stressed out, you will end up, it'll manifest itself with emotional fragile reactions. Eventually, if you do it long enough, it ends up into hopelessness. And we'll be talking about hopelessness a lot when we get into mental health and mental, uh, um, uh, mental health for our lives. But it, it's about the way in which we see our future. The wrong way in which we approach our tomorrows is so closely tied uh, uh, to our emotions. Because when we live without emotional boundaries and emotional fences, we lose hope. And when we lose hope in tomorrow, it's a result of an emotional tank that has run dry way too long. So before I can manage my emotions, I need to realize that my feelings are not always reliable. 
that my feelings can lead me in a wrong direction. How many times have you thought, I just know this is right? All oh, the people that come up to me and say, you know what, I'm going to be doing this. You know, I just know what's right. And I go, well, how do you know that it's right? Well, how, how did you land on this being right for you? I don't know. I just feel it. I just feel it out of my gut. I, you know what? Do you understand today that you can feel something's right in your gut and it can be the wrongest thing in the whole wide world? Your emotions will lead you down a blind alley. You cannot depend on everything you feel. And if you don't learn to control your emotions, they will control you. And you can be manipulated by your own moods and by the stories in your head because they will direct you. Your, the stories in your head will direct you more than truth, which is why we're always told to submit those feelings and submit those emotions to the control of God. You need to understand today that God cannot be God in our life if emotions are God in our life. God will never be God in my life if emotions are God in my life. God cannot rule my life if emotions rule my life. And if emotions are ruling your life, your choices, your decisions, your actions, and your behaviors, there's a good chance that God's not on the throne in your life. Jesus can't be Lord if emotions are Lord. And if I make all my decisions based simply on how I feel, then I've made a God of those emotions. And Paul said, he wrote a letter to the Romans, and he said this. He said, to be controlled by human nature results in death, but to be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Those who obey the human nature can never, ever please God. Now, on February 24th, we have a course that we're starting. It's about life in the Spirit. I would love for you to come. We will actually teach about how you can live a life according to the Spirit of God. But if I don't manage these emotions, they'll manage me. And Jesus wants to be Lord of how you feel and not just what you think and not just what you do. He wants to be Lord of your emotions. So how do I then manage the unwanted feelings? When all of these things, when it comes to the end of it, what do I do with it? Now, this is a really simplistic approach. I get it. But for the sake of time, I think the first thing we need to do is identify them. We need to identify the emotions. What am I really feeling anyways? Some of us just feel the feelings without ever taking the time to say, what is it that I'm actually feeling? Identify the feeling. Can I pinpoint it? Because you cannot change what you cannot identify. And some of us have emotions that are just running wild. And we've never taken the time to say, okay, why am I feeling like this? Where did it come from? And is it real? What's the real reason that I'm feeling this feeling? Is it God? Is it the enemy? Is it a circumstance? Is it somebody? Is it true? you got to challenge what you're feeling because you can't just automatically accept what you're feeling. And I think for some of you, you'd go a long way by just stopping and saying, okay, what is the feelings that I'm feeling when these situations come up? And are the feelings real? I'm not saying that I'm not feeling them. I'm not talking about denial. I'm just saying, what is the source? How real really is it? Because we need, to, we, we need to learn how to ask God to help us to identify and to evaluate the feelings in our lives. That's why God gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. Because as we live surrendered to Him, the Holy Spirit wants to steer our emotions and steal our feelings. And I can't stress this enough. That you need to have, the, uh, you need to, to, to invite the person of the Holy Spirit who wants to speak in your life. That's why Jesus left this earth. Jesus said, I have to leave because if I don't leave, then the Holy Spirit, who is called the Comforter, it's another name for him. He said, if I leave, then the Comforter will come. And what does a comfort do? Comforter? It comforts the emotions. It leads and guides and helps put into perspective. And so we need the Holy Spirit to guide us and steer us in our emotional truth. But I also can't stress this enough. Sometimes you need Jesus with skin on. You need people in your life, mentors, friends, people who can challenge the feelings. People that you have permitted to speak to the heart. Have you given anybody, here's a question for you, have you given anybody in your life the permission to challenge your feelings? I'm not just your actions, I'm talking about your feelings before the actions. Have you given anybody the right and the permission to say, you know what, I want to challenge you on those feelings because I don't think those feelings are accurate. I think you're feeling them, but I don't think that, that you have a good understanding of where they're coming from and what the source is. So you got to be able to name it. Here's what I'm feeling. you got to understand and, and challenge the reason why you're feeling it. I believe that, that you have to understand and, and be able to identify, is this helping me or hurting me? And then I believe you got to tame it. I think you need to tame your emotions. And sometimes you just need to change what you're feeling. 
Because emotions are destructive and they're damaging and they're hurtful. Now I know that I, I just said that for some of you are going, well how? I understand all this. That's what this whole topic was about, Pastor. Get on with it. How do I tame my emotions? How do I bring the highs of anger down? How do I calm that, the fears that I have? How do I move into joy and peace and all the things that we're talking about? Sometimes, once you identify it, and once you authenticate its source, you need to call it for what it is. You need to call it a lie. Sometimes the feelings that we're experiencing are founded in a lie, and you need to identify the lie and replace the lie with the truth. And when you understand that, then you do it over and over again. Because you know what? You can say, you know what? I'm an, I know I'm angry, but I need to do something about this anger. And I know that I'm hurting right now, but I got to do something with this hurt because I can't keep hurting anymore. And I got to do something with this sadness. I'm tired of being sad all the time. I'm tired of being afraid all the time. I'm tired of being anxious all the time. I need to find the truth that God has said about who I am and what I am and what I'm to be. And I need to replace whatever it is that I'm feeling with the truth of God's word for my life. That's why Paul said in Corinthians that we are to take our thoughts captive. We are to take our imaginations and, our, and the narratives of our heart. We need to take them captive because sometimes you just need to go, stop it. So let me make this personal for all of us. Let's bring this home. I, uh, I, I hate the weight of unnecessary stuff. Uh, I like to, when I travel, I like to travel lean and mean. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not a lot of baggage person. If you go on a trip, if you take lots of luggage and baggage, um, you know, I, I hate the carousel. I hate waiting in line and everything else. I, I like to stuff everything I can onto a carry on. And uh, you know what? Sometimes you can't do that. But if I could, I, I would put everything on a carry on. And I like to be able to be very, very mobile. And, and as we go through life, there's more than just physical baggage. When we talk about emotional issues, sometimes we will identify it as emotional baggage. So I just want to talk a little bit about, about what does emotional baggage look like? What are those things that we should not pack away in our lives? And let me just say, we pray, we ask God, we read the scriptures, we allow the Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do for ourselves. But many times we have to identify the source of the emotional baggage. And what about things like condemnation? Is there condemnation in your life? Feeling condemned when you've wronged someone or broken a rule or acted inappropriately. If you have feelings like you're never going to be free, that we're never going to make it, we're never going to, we're never going to come forward. We, we hang on to these feelings of condemnation sometimes because we would rather punish ourselves rather than accept the free grace of forgiveness of God. And maybe it's time, I'm just suggesting for some of you, maybe it's time that you give your permission to stop playing what if and should have. Maybe it's time to stop playing what if and should have because the power of our faith is that we don't have to do anything with our feelings of condemnation except give them over to Jesus. That's why he died on the cross. And for some of you, one of the greatest pieces of baggage you could get rid of emotionally is to say, you know what? Jesus forgives my condemnation and I'm no longer going to walk in that myself. I think another piece of emotional baggage we need to get rid of is regret. It's so easy to get stuck into a rut of regret, imagining what life would be like if you had just done this or that better. We can't predict our future and we should never punish ourselves over the past. But for some of you, just some of you, maybe it's time you stop treating yourself like a victim and start living like a victor. Maybe it's time that you stop playing the victim card and blaming your history and blaming your past and walking in regret for all the things that you've been going through. Maybe it's time you start going through what you've been going through and get through it. I know it's not easy, but for some of you, you're just hanging on too tight. You're emotionally hanging on too tight, and it's like you're squeezing the life out of these feelings and emotions because there's so much regret in your life. You cannot change your yesterday, but you can start today and make a brand new tomorrow. Maybe it's time to let go of the regret. Just an idea. I think another piece of baggage we should let go of is being our own inner critic. We tend to judge ourselves more harshly than even others in our lives. And there are little voices in our head. And when those voices get too loud and too strong and they're screaming at us, you'll never, you'll never make it. You'll never get over it. You'll never be okay. You'll never get free of this. 
And and there's these moments where we have to say to ourselves, you know what, I need to take those thoughts and those feelings and I got to put them in a box or I got to put them somewhere because those voices are no good to us. And you have to take authority of those voices. And sometimes that voice is the enemy, but sometimes it's just your voice. Yes, it's a voice of the past. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it was somebody, a friend or a buddy who spoke those words into your life. But sometimes it's just you. You're looking in the mirror and you're saying things to yourself and you're beating yourself up. And maybe it's time to let go of the regret. What about anger? When someone wrongs us and we observe injustice and, and, and the anger just kind of gets up and there's been somebody has hurt us and, and we're hanging onto this anger and it's hurtful and we're getting angry and angry by the moment. And when time, and, and, and there's a time to be angry. There's a time to rant. I'm not saying that you, you, you stuff them. I'm not a stuffer. I, I'm a gusher. But I think there's a moment where you can say, you know what? There's a time to rant and scream and yell and get it all out. I don't mean in an inappropriate way. Don't kick the dog or anything or anybody else for that matter. But there's a time to let the anger out in a way that is healthy and it's appropriate. But there's a time to say, that's enough. Some of you have not disciplined your lives to say, that's enough. That's enough with the anger. It's enough with the resentment. I'm tired of allowing that to control my life. Today, it ends. And you go to the person and say, this is why I'm angry. And you tell them how you're feeling. And if they, if they ask forgiveness, you give it. And if they don't ask forgiveness, you still move on because it's their problem, not yours. But you take responsibility for your role in whatever it is that's got you so angry and you learn how to forgive yourself. But instead of blaming others for what's going on in your life and saying, well, what could I have done better? But it's time for some of us to say, you know what? I'm worn out. I'm tired of being so angry. Only you can get rid of that piece of baggage. Time is gone. Stress and worry could go on and on and on, but you get the point. So let me invite you to close your eyes right now. Everybody just close your eyes. Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians, and it was just a sentence, but he said this. He said, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Your attitude. Now, attitude is the approach. It's the way you approach life. It's the way in which... I would suggest to you today, it's the way in which you approach the feelings. And as we talk through this today, the three bags of emotions that plague us more than any others are guilt, grief, and grudges. So let me just speak to these three bags in our lives today. First of all, what are you guilty about? Whether you feel guilt or whether you're experiencing shame, when I start talking about guilt, what pops into your head? What's haunting you? And all the minimalizing and the rationalizing and the compromising and the blaming and the beating yourself up, it's just not working anymore. It's time to stop rationalizing, excusing it. It's time to stop beating yourself up. What are you feeling guilty about? Because Jesus Christ can remove that guilt like nobody else can. He specializes in new beginnings. Is today the day that you could stop the condemnation and walk free? to accept the free grace of forgiveness and to stop punishing yourself for the past, what is causing you the guilt? What about your grief? Are you looking at life about what's left or what's lost? What about those things that is just, it's incapacitating to you? You're grieving. You're grieving a loss. You're grieving a hurt. You're grieving a pain. You're grieving a relationship. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a relationship that you thought you trusted somebody. You thought it was this, but it's really not that. And you feel locked in a prison. I want to speak this into your life today. Nobody locked the door. You locked it yourself. The door of grief was not locked from the outside. The door of grief is locked from the inside. You have the power to open the door and let the grief go today. Let it go. Tell the Holy Spirit, I'm tired of grieving. Tell the Holy Spirit, I am tired of the guilt and the shame. I'm tired of the condemnation. What about the grudges? Are you still allowing people in your past or situations of the past to hurt your present? 
Are you still angry about something that happened six weeks ago, six months ago, six years ago, 20 years ago? How's that working for you? Only you have the power to let go of that anger, those grudges, to stop rehearsing the story, to stop the narrative in your head that you say over and over and over and over and over and over again. And all it does is it just boils the anger back up. It boils it all up. At some point, you have got to stop and stop letting them hurt you. Now let it go. And under your breath, God, I give you my guilt. I give you my shame and condemnation. God, I open the door of my grief and I let it out. God, I let go of the grudges, the anger, the unforgiveness. In a moment, I let go of the fear, the anger, the shame, and the anxiousness. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, I pray.
right now in the room, would you take a deep breath? Slowly let it out. Holy Spirit, come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Help us to let go of the baggage that keeps our emotions in prison. Today, I pray you'll set the captive free and allow us to walk in the newness of faith that we will bring together the spiritual maturity and the emotional health that they will come together to help us to become everything that you create us to be that you'll restore the joy of our salvation and heal us by the power of your spirit. And may the calm of our soul be our portion this week. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gabby, come and close us off. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning. We trust that this was meaningful and beneficial to you. Before you head out this morning, we want to welcome you to our Connect Wall. It's out in the atrium. You can't miss it. It's a big blue wall. And there you will find booklets with all of the courses, um, home groups that we have going on. So we just want to invite you to check that out before you leave. Lastly, I do need help stacking chairs. So if we could stack them 10 high as well as move these two risers to the side, that would be a fantastic help. We hope you have a great week week and we look forward to seeing you next week.